with our moderator, Mr. Brett Colvin. Brett, Brett Colvin is Good Lawyer's co-founder and CEO. Brett has overseen Good Lawyer's growth from inception to a 25-plus person team. Brett was a corporate lawyer for four plus years, which we will not hold against him, and he experienced firsthand that most business owners can't afford the legal help they need. So he quit the big firm, teamed up with a developer and a designer, and got to work rolling up his sleeves to build something better. Cheers to you for that. Cheers to this panel, and uh, we're going to kick things off. Brett, to you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, great to see a pretty solid crowd out here. And if Kalea can see or hear me right now, I'm sorry, but I'm going to deviate a little bit from the script. So um, I'm excited. I think that I'm probably uh, the noob in uh, this panel right now in terms of learning about the metaverse and Web3 more generally. But it's certainly an area that uh, has been really exciting for Good Lawyer. And I can, I can tell the vibes in this room, um, the city, the province in general, that Web3 is going to be uh, an important part of Alberta's future. So with that, today we have a great panel, and I know some diverse opinions. Uh, we've got Big Four, Big Law, New Law, and two entrepreneurs that are actively building in Web3. So before we get into the questions, thank you for those, Kalea. Um, I'm going to give each panelist here an opportunity to give us a 60-second intro, which better include your fun fact, j Dog. So with that, why don't we kick it off with you, Julie? All right. So my name is Julie Bogle. I'm a partner in the Corporate Capital Markets Group at BLG, which is a national full service law firm and a proud member of our digital assets group. So how I help teams is often through M&A, corporate finance, strategy, uh, and it's really helpful to have somebody on the inside that knows how digital asset companies work to streamline due diligence processes, to connect you to the right investment banks, insurers, others that are in the industry that are welcome and receptive to working with the digital assets companies. Because not everybody has the warm fuzzies, but there are some great champions out there. And my fun fact is that I've traveled to over 40 countries. And I'm really excited by the metaverse because I've been really impacted by on the ground cultural sharings. And I'm hoping that the metaverse can help expand our horizons in that respect and help us reimagine what face-to-face -face means. Fantastic. Karim, over to you, my friend. Thank you. Um, I'm the president and CEO of uh, iMining Technologies. We're a publicly traded uh, company on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol IMIN. And, uh, we pride ourselves in being um, pioneers in the metaverse because we're helping uh, hospitals, uh, financial institutions, uh, legal firms enter the metaverse, uh, sort of like Glen Rose. Um, um, fun fact of mine is I'm considered one of the oldest miners in the world. I started mining in 2010, uh, and I started mining off of my family's uh, family office computers and literally got kicked out of my family office. <laughs> J-Dog. Well, my name is Jonathan Han, uh, AKA J-Dog. <laughs> so uh, I'm currently the managing director of Virgo CX. Uh, Virgo CX is a licensed crypto trading platform based in Toronto. Uh, we're licensed to service all provinces in Canada. Uh, I mainly work on institutional sales, uh, expansions, and all the uh, other fun stuff. So fun fact is I'm currently picking up my Japanese again to service our Japanese clients. So if you are fluent in Japanese, don't talk to me in Japanese because I'm not <laughs> fluent yet. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Yeah. And Mr. KPMG. Uh, thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Kunal Basin. I'm a director with KPMG here in Canada, and I co-lead our crypto asset and blockchain center of excellence um, the way we are structured at KPMG, the center of excellence really sits on top of the three core pillars, which is consulting, audit, and tax. So anything crypto related comes through us, and we pick and choose the right team and the right skill sets and the people to be able to deliver work to our clients. Fun fact about me, um, if you were here for the last conference that we had, my fun fact hasn't changed. Uh, <laughs> it's still the same. Uh, the fun fact still remains that I joined KPMG four years ago, uh, and one of the leaders in our firm told me in, our, in my first week uh, when, when I was brought in to build a crypto practice, uh, he told me in the first week that crypto is not going to stay. 
uh, regulation is going to eat it out of existence. And three years later, we added crypto to our treasury and I led that initiative. So, you know, super excited about that and started with crypto. Um, then again, went and bought the NFT and now we're on to next. Does so, he work for you now? <laughs> no, I wish. <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, I know from our pre-call that we definitely do have some different opinions on at least a few of the things we're going to talk about today, not to mention Decentraland, but uh, we'll get there. So uh, I'd love to kick things off here with Kurum. You're uh, one of the OGs in Web3 kind of across the board. So the word metaverse means a lot of things to a lot of different people. What is the metaverse to you? And importantly, how would you define its key value to business? Um, you know, it's really interesting when I'm speaking with, you know, big financial institutions and they keep asking this question, why the metaverse? Why is the largest bank in the world, JP Morgan, going in decentralized land and setting up shop? Like, what's the point? Um, and, you know, the main explanation I give, which is, really quick is it's a more immersive internet right and it means a lot of things to a lot of people but one of the things which blockchain has done to the metaverse is decentralized it so now people like yourself and myself can own part of the underlying technology and the underlying platform instead of these big tech uh, companies and the other thing i explained to them is we're not the metaverse is not for us. The metaverse is for the future. So it is for probably our kids and our kids' kids. Because when you see kids using the metaverse, it's, it's, they get it, right? And it's very hard for people my age or older than me or even a little bit younger than me. It's very hard for them to understand uh, the benefits of it. And the main benefit you can see is just take a kid into the metaverse and see how quickly they are able to move around and get around it. So it, it, is, it is, I really believe, the technology of the future. And some of the Bitcoin maximalists, which, which world I come from, uh, think it's completely shit and fluff. And I explained to them that, you know, it's, um, if, you, if you go on Google and you search Bitcoin, there's about four to five billion search results. And go and search Metaverse. There's already two and a half billion search results. So what Bitcoin was able to do in people's mind in 10, 12 years. Uh, Metaverse has been able to do in, in about a year to two years. And it's key value to business, my friend. Key value to business. I think it's more at experimental stage right now and more in terms of PR. Like JP Morgan spent a few million dollars setting up their Metaverse presence. Uh, but the PR and the global recognition it got was worth billions of dollars. And they looked cooler. It was easier for them to attract talent. So uh, the current use cases in education, some in healthcare, but the, I, I really believe the current we don't we haven't even seen how the metaverse will be used uh, in the future. And I think it's going to affect value in every single segment of uh, business. Yeah, so I mean, picking up on what you were saying, it's really interesting reading about the metaverse because it's evolved so quickly in terms of what is the metaverse. So when I started reading about it probably 10 months ago, I really thought metaverse is a virtual world with Web3 and blockchain enabled infrastructure. And I don't believe that anymore. I don't think that it has to be. And I think originally the concept of a common platform that we all go to and trying to figure out who's going to be the first to the top that's kind of what a lot of people were thinking. But now, as I start to see what Meta is doing, what Microsoft is doing, I'm appreciating that there is space for basically hyped up Web2 uh, websites where people aren't going to want you to be able to take your data from one metaverse to another. There might be various different da um, metaverses out there. There might not just be one that we all aggregate to because of the money involved in developing the metaverse to a point where it's more than a second life or it's more than an open source, what people can give to an open source to make it feel like it's worth spending your time at. So it's, it's interesting seeing how quickly, how much people are talking about it and how quickly it's changing in terms of what it will become. And 
who knows? I mean, I think some of the easiest applications that I can think of right now are really in the entertainment and gaming sectors, whether you have that digital twinning where you can go and meet Beyonce, like 10 people can meet Beyonce at the same time and she can be have the artificial intelligence to make it feel real, or whether we all go and purchase the same center line uh, ticket to the Super Bowl and can view it like we're really there. I think that there are some real world entertainment applications to it that might come out first. And then who knows, like I think there's a lot more that will come. Julie, before you jump in your mind, is like the avatar a key feature of the metaverse or you know any sort of communications? Like what would fall within your sort of? So that really depends on what it means uh, for that user experience. Is the user experience to watch something, in which case an avatar that's at the Super Bowl may not be relevant? Or is it to interact with others, to share trainings? Is it about being in an office, a boardroom and having that body language in addition to the facial that we currently get with um, you know, teams or whatnot? So I think it depends on the use case. I think of it as an avatar and most avatars don't have legs. So we're like not totally there on the body language yet, um, but it, it's still to be determined. Kunal, yeah, <laughs> give us uh, your two cents on the metaverse. I know you had some strong opinion. Yeah, the way I, I think of Metaverse, and, and you know, I, I kind of agree with Julie, where the narrative has changed a lot since the beginning of the term Metaverse. I think it gained a lot more momentum because of COVID, because people started working remotely, companies were starting to think about how they can become more collaborative because they just don't want you know, a bunch of people's faces over there. How can it be a more immersive experience? But I don't necessarily think we are at a point where we will have that one platform where everybody converges and talks about and, and collaborates in a way where it's just the company itself and they're interacting with other companies. So that B2B interaction is not gonna happen. Uh, if it's happening today, it's at a very low scale. The way I think about how Metaverse has evolved in the last couple of years is there are centralized platforms that perform very specific use cases which are relevant for the organizations today uh, the decentralized nature of, of metaverse and you know platforms like Decentraland, I feel like there's a lot of issues still there that need to be uh, addressed for the institutions to get in uh, in a meaningful manner. Um, at this point, the integration of Web3 and NFT into those centralized platforms in some way, shape or form is gonna be interesting to see how that plays out because, uh, I mean, if you just look at the numbers, right? Like Fortnite uh, has the Web2 platform for Fortnite it has sold 20 billion worth of cosmetic, just apparel and everything in the last four years. So that's big. That's more than what Prada and some of the other brands have sold in the real life. So I definitely see the value there for a lot of you know, companies like retail that are in the metaverse, which, do not, which are not subject to the high level of regulatory environment that let's say banks would be faced with. So that's why opening a branch in, in, in the metaverse may just not be I, I don't know if there's value enough there. Well, uh, um, people like JP Morgan would defer with that. People like Jamie Dimon would defer with that. And it's so interesting to see, you know, my, my think is about impact. When email came out, uh, I don't know if anyone has seen Bill Gates' uh, interview on, I think, Jay Leno or something, and people were laughing about email. I don't think we can live a life without email in the professional world. So this technology is impactful and one of the things that really touched my heart was when we when we did um, uh, creation for this 13 year old uh, patient at the Glen Rose Hospital here in Al Alberta in Edmonton and uh, I was speaking with the father uh, at an event and I said imagine that your daughter would be able to uh, go inside the metaverse and say hello dad and he hasn't heard his daughter for 13 years so that type of impact uh, for at least learning disability can be massive uh, in, in, inside uh, the metaverse. I was just told today that this same girl, Olivia, first time moved her wheelchair by just thinking by using these technologies. So we can look at metaverse more as an overarching tool where we can integrate so many different technologies of Web 2 and Web 3 to create impact in especially in healthcare, especially in education, where I think it can really benefit more than business currently. Yeah. 
for sure. Just to add on that, I think hard to top the hospital story. That's really, really <laughs> touching. But <clears throat> so I think really for for me, as you know, as a, also working at a crypto trading platform, we've looked into metaverse obviously pretty heavily in the past few years. Um, and you know, we we want to also offer you know potentially trading for that. But then when we look at the data and the demands uh, for a broker to offer this. The demand is not there. So I think for us to do this, we're still in a very, very early stage. And looking into the data, I think uh, it probably peaked search last year or early this year in January. And it is really, I think, on the PR side, like you said, but also people are trading. Um, they're just not using uh, a regulated platform. They're going to OpenSea or whatnot, right? Uh, but for me, there are two big traits for Metaverse. Is One is the digital identity. Yeah, the other one is permanent. So, you know, there are concepts of metaverse 10, 20 years ago already. Like when you talk about, um, you know, the Japanese society, a lot of them used to live in the metaverse, but, you know, the definition has changed. But I think really is the permanent and the digital identity has shaped the new concept of metaverse now. So just for example, that, you know, you know in touch of uh, Julie said gaming, uh, gaming, let's say if I was on World of Warcraft, which is an online game, then these objects on there are technically, they are NFTs, but they're owned by Blizzard. So you don't own it. And if Blizzard goes down, which it recently got sold to Microsoft, I think, then you know the ownership also transferred, and the worst case, it closed down and you lose it forever. So I think that part, it is really important, and that's why people are looking into that and trying to reshape this metaverse right now. Well, Kunal, you brought up Fortnite. Is that the key difference? Is that you know the twenty billion being spent over Fortnite is run by a, a company instead of being decentralized? Yeah, is that so what would take it into Web three. Um, yeah, so if you think about th those twenty billion dollars, right? Like, it's not pe people are not actually owning the assets that they're paying for, right? And I, I, I truly believe in that Web three capabilities that will be embedded into the metaverse. The uh, the aspect of ownership is actually going to be quite valuable. Right. If Fortnite goes like public net today, right, every person and every developer and, and stuff and people that are wanted to get into investing into Fortnite, they're going to get into a valuation at what, 30 billion dollars or something at this point. But if they in a decentralized manner, and that's where I see the value, but we're way too early in that in Decentraland, people have gotten in and they've gotten the option to opt into this platform and being able to contribute in a DAO and be part of the growth of the platform itself. Um, I don't know what the future of Fortnite would look like, whether they're gonna you know, bring in some Web3 capabilities in there, but I, I just feel that I, I see the value uh, from a gaming standpoint, but from an institutional standpoint, and that's where we look at it a lot, from an institutional standpoint, the decentralized platforms are not there yet, right? We are, we've looked at decentralized quite a bit as well, and, uh, there are still some challenges that need to be addressed. And I'm at, at a point where internally we're discussing whether or not and, and how um, we should contribute to the DAO and put in some proposals for bringing in those improvements. So I think that's the role that we are playing at this point, knowing that this is something that has potential in the future. But as of now, for the institutions that are going in just for the sake of going in, um, I, I feel like there, there's not enough business case there for PR, yes, maybe, um, but actual value to their customers, being able to connect with their customers, considering that platform as an additional channel for increasing their business, it's, it's not there yet. Just to add to that, thank you. I really appreciate Pranav's um, insight. Uh, you know, it's so interesting to see like companies like Accenture and other companies uh, get into the metaverse because it is also very good for talent acquisition right the young people want to find it interesting want to be fun have a fun workplace work at home so it's a the uh, covid has really changed the mindset of how future of work is going uh, going to look so i think uh, perceptively a company uh, like today you cannot be a company and don't have a website. If you say, oh, I have this big company and I don't have a website, people are going to look at you weird, right? And, and that's sort of what's happening in the minds of youth today. If you have a metaverse presence, you are future ready, right? You seem future ready and they want to aspire to work for companies 
which are future ready. So I think uh, many companies, um, in terms of values, I agree they've gone down. But in terms of adoption and people uh, identifying it has just astronomically uh, grown and growing on a on a daily basis at faster faster than uh, crypto. You just need Tom Hanks to make a you got NFT movie or something. <laughs> Maybe I just add one last point there. Um, you know, when Kunal talk about Decentraland, and these decentralized platform, they're not truly decentralized. They are a hybrid of centralized and decentralized because obviously the technology does not permit at this moment. So, but, but that's where you want to drive the adoption. If you truly want to have a decentralized platform, then it will be impossible to use. So, um, and I do think that, you know, this will grow, this will change, but currently a lot of them that claim they, are decentralized, want to be decentralized fully in the future, but not at the moment. Yes, you said. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm on to question number two. Uh, this one's going to be for you, Julie, first. As in other parts of crypto, corporations, banks, and investors have leaned into NFTs and other forms of digital value ahead of any real regulatory clarity. What do you predict? And then I'll touch on you guys too. Uh, for the next year in regulation of the metaverse in Canada and to the extent, uh, you know, more globally? None. I don't think there's going to be any regulation in Canada in the metaverse for the next year. The regulators in Canada are... So the regulatory landscape in Canada is interesting because right now, uh, how most crypto is regulated is, is it a security or is it not? Same for NFTs. Is it a security or is it not? Then you go to the securities regulators, which in Canada, we don't have an SEC that's a federal regulator. We have provincial regulators. So that means that there's a lot more people in the room when decisions have to be made and regulations have to be uh, drafted. And what that's meant in Canada has been, there's been some really good changes. So because Quadriga, Quadriga happened a bit in our backyard, there was uh, a push to protect retail early, and they started with crypto asset trading platforms, or what people mostly call exchanges. So that's where the focus is right now. And so we've got regulators across the country working with businesses to help figure out how do we properly regulate this sector, this industry. And so there was some more clarity that came out last year on you know, basically doing a securities registration or having certain um, exemptions with ultimately becoming an IROC dealer, the same thing that like an investment banker would have to be in terms of trading securities. So that's where the regulators are right now. And where they're kind of going is from this experience, from working with a lot of companies in this room or on this stage, learning about their business and how they're trading, how they're operating, they're figuring out other things. So like staking is coming up now. And there's other parts of regulation that are starting to emerge and evolve based on the businesses that are already operating. The metaverse is so complicated and it's such a big hairy beast to figure out how to properly regulate. I think that the regulators have their hands tied. They likely will go to stable coins next with the Terra Luna collapse. And I think that the metaverse will be something that comes, but not within the next year. And part of the reason it's this big hairy beast is because what jurisdiction is a metaverse? So if we're talking about meta, if we're talking about Microsoft, and we're talking about basically an amped up website, it's probably the terms of use that are going to dictate the jurisdiction that governs that interaction on the metaverse. But if it's a DAO, then is it based on where the physical users are located? Or is it based on where they are located when they are doing a trade? Like there's so many things to think through. Or if a business is involved, like how does that jurisdiction come into play? So at this point, I don't think that it's a high issue. And also because there's not a large user adoption yet, there's not necessarily a lot of damages that are flowing in an aggregate maybe on an individual basis, something really significant is happening, but how do you quantify um, the, like the emotional distress that happens in the metaverse? I don't know. It's a great question. And for me, you know, my lawyer cap on for a second, like intellectual property. IP is how great. do you register intellectual property in the metaverse? Like, I, I don't know. What jurisdiction do you go for that for? 
you know this i think this is a massive opportunity for the alberta securities commission and the regulators across canada because there are other countries which are taking lead like dubai just held their dubai metaverse assembly uh and you know they want to take uh, neom wants to take the size of manhattan into the metaverse and sell properties before they even start building in real life so we have an opportunity here instead of us lagging on technology like virtual asset service or stable coins which different countries have already started to regulate we have an opportunity to leap in front uh in alberta and be the metaverse uh, jurisdiction of choice globally because the world currently is looking for a jurisdiction like this i think when we talk about the regulations a lot of that is you know when we when we start talking about the use cases with, with the various organizations and the clients that we're talking to about metaverse um regulations are not top of their mind because most of them are and and don't get me wrong like I'm, i believe in the central land and what it could do in the future um but right now it's it's a lot of these centralized platforms when we launched uh so kpmg we launched a collaboration hub in the metaverse not and again it was hard for me to accept that term at the beginning that it's it's an engaged platform right it's a centralized it's piece like of software with the yeah it, it, it's it's a it's a centralized piece of software so when i th- thought of metaverse it was always about you know the still being in the ethos of the crypto ecosystem the web3 capabilities including nft crypto assets stable coins transaction capabilities within those and you don't get those capabilities in the centralized platforms today so i think metaverse it's evolved from being that transactional capability requirement to something that's centralized and addressing use cases like education use case some of the other centralized use cases that Kuram mentioned as well um training is a big one right uh for a bank and if there are any bankers out here like how much time do you do you take to train the employees uh that are in a branch serving clients you can do a lot of that in the in the metaverse platform where they are able to interact with the clients uh in the metaverse you're able to track from a data standpoint you're able to track how much time did they spend making eye contact with let's say four people that are sitting in front of them how did they interact what was the tone positive or negative you're able to assess a lot of those insights uh and give quality feedback to your employees to improve so i totally believe in in all of that but regulation doesn't have a role to play there unless there is there are nfts involved there are three cap transaction capabilities in, involved so other than that it's just a saas kind of platform the some of the regulations like when you speak about training i think about the aviation abilities to train where you you need certain equipment like i drove by something and there was a massive like a, a sate like institution and there was this massive airplane in the hangar and i just thought about how much money is sitting on the ground there not being used but needs to be there so that mechanics can train on the machines and figure out if you could move some of that to the metaverse there could be huge opportunities and maybe there's some regulation that has to happen in those specific use cases to ensure that there's the right quality controls as opposed to metaverse regulation yeah i i, I totally agree with that and i think um even then ip is still becomes still is a big question right especially in a decentralized platform um on a centralized platform ip is still addressable but one of the questions um that I started to a client about decentraland was do we consider this as a software as a service platform and i don't think we have the right answer for that yet well yeah with the ip piece in particular it seems like there's just a new gatekeeper and maybe we like that gatekeeper more but at the end of the day it doesn't seem to replace the need for a gate gatekeeper and Jonathan yeah, yeah. we got to hear cuz you're on the ground dealing with the regs <laughs> yes so i don't think i can say much without getting into trouble i don't want this to be court evidence uh, obviously <laughs> but but i think from a trading platform point of view obviously it is very challenging as julie said to really navigate in terms of the regulations for this that's also why we don't offer this from Virgo CX uh as in you know NFT trading metaverse um that being said i think is also the case that the demand is not strong enough for us to 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 prove that this is a valid business case to open a new vertical so and that a lot of time this is very demand driven so for example when you looking at Uber or any of the previous high growth tech 
uh, when they enter Canada, they also did not have any regulation for that, and they just entered it. And their general manager got arrested, and they paid, and it, it now it's okay. But I think that for that, it, it is, I think, um, it is coming, and people will offer this service in Canada, obviously, from a regulated uh, entity standpoint, um, but it will just take time. Yeah. yeah, no, I love that point, because I think I'm in total agreement with the fact that businesses tend to drive the ball forward and the regulator reacts. Sometimes maybe the regulator is out in front of it, but I'd say that's few and far between. Yeah, like when you say businesses drive this forward, right? Like Nike has already made like what, 180 million in NFT sales um, and more than a billion dollars in secondary market of those NFT sales. So the opportunity is there, the market's there, maybe just not for the institutions that we were originally thinking of like the financial institutions, the banks, to be able to serve their clients in the metaverse. But for a lot of these retailers, those clients are already here. Those institutions are already here. Like if you think about what Gucci is doing, I think there was a metaverse fashion show as well. Um, yesterday I saw a video on LinkedIn, someone was getting married in the metaverse. I, I don't know if that's gonna become an industry on its own. Uh, but you know, that's where you start to think, where do you draw the line where the value is being brought in to the organization and uh, and value could not could be in monetary terms or the non-monetary terms around employee retention, employee attraction. And a lot of those things are things that are the business case that form the business case today for someone like a bank maybe to come in. But um, there's a lot more value in retail and some of the other industries in the metaverse today, especially through the primary and secondary sales of those NFT. And last thing I would say is it's, you get one opportunity to get in and do the right thing. If you mess that up, then your brand is not gonna be looked at the same way and I was before. I mean, have you, is anyone from Budweiser here? Hope not, but have you looked at the Budweiser's NFT collection or the Pepsi Mic Crop NFT collection? They weren't able, able they, they weren't even able to sell the entire collection on an OpenSea platform. Forget what they're gonna be able to do in the metaverse. Yeah, I was watching the uh, this new Spotify show on Netflix last night, just a couple episodes, and you know the importance of the moment where they cut the new deals with the record labels on how they can monetize. Do you see there being like an inflection point where we just make a decision on it and that's what drives forward, or um, is there is there a right or a wrong way, or is there just we got to figure it out? Yeah, I'll put that to you, Crown. Uh, <clears throat> So, you know, it's uh, interesting because you have these centralized companies like Microsoft and Facebook doing the heavy lifting. I mean, Facebook has already spent, according to the balance sheet, over $15 billion just developing. Uh, and now with the new uh, partnership with Microsoft, I mean, uh, I think we've already sort of lost the fight of not being able to control the metaverse because now you've got Facebook and Microsoft uh, partnering in the metaverse so good luck for anyone else trying to compete with uh, with them and uh, but uh, it still leaves uh, on an opportunity uh, like it left an opportunity for bitcoin um, against the entire banking system of the world there's still an um, uh, opportunity which is massive and big enough for decentralized uh, metaverses against these uh, not against but piggybacking on these uh, uh, centralized uh, metaverses. And it is moving at rocket speed. I mean, some of the meetings that we are in and the type of technology being developed, I mean, just give you a simple idea, is um, an AI, uh, the uh, AI capabilities increasing at an exponential uh, speed. And you now merge AI uh, with capability of, you know, uh, doctors or lawyers and teachers, you basically start like finishing different pr professions uh, because the AI has better capability, uh, even from judgment. I mean, uh, there was there was if, if you go in front of a judge after lunch, you uh, you get less uh, uh, less sentence. And if you go before lunch, you get a longer sentence. Now, an AI tool would wouldn't have those type of biases. So it is these integration of technologies which is what we call, I think, Web3 more than anything else is integration of all these technologies and trying to decentralize it so we uh, still have a chance uh, 
to compete or be uh, in the ecosystem with the big tech? Well, I'm going to have to push back on getting rid of lawyers. Uh, I actually had a really, really, no, I had a really interesting chat with uh, a guy named Randy Goebel on a presentation yesterday. He's one of the founders of Amy up in Edmonton, the Alberta Machine Institute. And it's not that computers couldn't be better at providing judgment. It's that we can't let them or they should not. Law, even certain dynamics when it comes to health and you know that human element, we can't offload that to AI because it would, I think, kind of defeat the purpose, certainly in the world of law, of what it's like there for in the first place, which is to you know, govern human interactions more than anything else. Uh, all right. Thank you very much for number two. Um, I'll shoot this one over to you first, Kunal, because um, I think you've touched on it a little bit. Can businesses of all sizes benefit from a metaverse presence today, tomorrow, or is it just more, you know, the established brands? I got Samsung, Gucci seem to be there in, in there um, that can leverage the metaverse in its current state for what we've kind of talked about today, publicity and sales. I think the opportunity is there for any size of business. Good lawyer be in the metaverse is what I'm asking you. <laughs> Are you going to provide legal advice in the metaverse about metaverse? I mean, I think that is like a pretty good use case. Yes, it, it, it does. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, businesses of any size have the opportunity. I think it's get like I said earlier, you have to get get that right the first time. Right. You don't do not get a second chance uh, like. You know, and again, I, I know we keep touching on JP Morgan because they're the most established brand in the metaverse today. Um, like they have a tiger or a lion grooming around in their I office. See yeah, Karab showed it to me. <laughs> so um, there, there's a lot of things that you have to think about. What is it? What the objective is? Right? What use case are you trying to solve? What value are you trying to derive from from the metaverse use case? So, okay. So on that note, what is KPMG's use case? Our use case for we are not in the metaverse. You're not. We're not in the. And I say not, we're not in the metaverse. We're not in the metaverse. Decentralized metaverse yet, right? So what we are doing today is we're leveraging Engage platform um, to bring in our clients and really show them what the out of the possible is, right? What their office space is and what their employee collaboration or employee training experiences could look like in a virtual reality environment that involves more collaborative and more immersive experience for their employees. So for us, the reason why we in started with that initiative and, and you know built a metaverse presence in that engaged platform is to be able to bring in our clients, to be able to show them the other possible what, what they could be doing in the metaverse. That's why the focus on the use case and the strategy is key when it comes to metaverse. And for us, it's really helping them think through whether or not, what metrics are you going to track? How are you going to monitor the insights that are coming out of the data that you're collecting? What sort of data do you need to collect? And how are you going to generate the insights? How is that going to help the organization in another way? Uh, are you going to, is this some, a new channel for you to engage with your customers, right? Can, can you send a link in an email where one clicks, that person clicks that link and is sent to this metaverse platform where they can directly interact with um, let's say a client representative that's sitting out there in the metaverse. Are, are those the channels that you're trying to address? Why do you need that as well, right? If you think that you know the real life interaction is going to go away in the next five to ten years, um, I don't think that that's happening. I think metaverse is going to be considered as an additional channel, and I, I you know I agree with Karam on the fact that we're not building these metaverse platforms and metaverse presence for attracting the people of today. It, it is really for, for, to attract the people in the future. If you think about gaming, like more than 4 billion people in the world today are gamers. And if you think about you know, how that is growing and how, how what the age group of is for the people that are into these games, they're gonna, let, they're gonna be the future customers of these institutions. So how do you bring those, how do you attract those customers in the future is going to be a big use case for them. So being future ready is one thing and, and being able to invest in something right now that's giving you direct value and at the same time being able to look into what the future could bring is going to be a big thing for, for clients. So for any size of business, I think as long as they have got their use case, 
if it's mental health, if someone wants to open a mental health clinic in the metaverse to attract people who are able to talk to them, talk to some, you know, um, therapists in the metaverse because they do not want to reveal their identity. And I know a lot of people that are hesitant in going to a therapist in real life, but they would want to be able to do that in the metaverse because it's not the real identity. They're still not showing their actual face. It's an avatar, right? So people that are not able to do things um, in their own skin and would want to do something in the metaverse is going to be a big thing. Um, and I don't think when we when businesses are thinking about metaverse, don't think of, don't try and build a digital twin, right? Like no one needs a, a same kind of experience that you have in the Might real well life. Six four in the metaverse, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like there's no point building a digital twin. Like um, do something crazy, like have waterfalls in your office. Uh, like the tiger was a good touch by J.P. Morgan, but like do something crazy um, in in the metaverse that really shows an experience which is not. You know, which is which you're not able to give give to your customers in real life. I, I, I agree with jump out of I, seat, let him go. <laughs> I agree with most of the stuff, except I disagree with the fact that we only have one chance, right? We to, we're living in such a such a changing world right now, and I really believe every single business consultant student should experiment in the metaverse immediately. Because if we do that, we are making ourselves and our organization future ready. And if we go, I mean, no offense to big, big uh, accountants and big uh, law firm, but, you know, uh, regular business can't afford them anyway. So, so might as well <laughs> we experiment. Uh, and once we get big enough, then we can think of, okay, it being our only chance. But even big uh, companies like Pepsi and uh, uh, what Kunal mentioned, I have Budweiser. already started uh, testing, right? So I really believe this uh, over the next few years, you're going to see experimentation by everybody. You're going to talk about universities, hospitals, uh, governments. I mean, you're talking about a regulator in Dubai going inside the metaverse, right? You're talking about more banks uh, in Dubai going into Decentraland. So I really believe that this is a time... If you do it once, you fail, do it second, fail, third, fail, because we have an opportunity to fail right now. And we should all embrace that. I think the reputational impact that an organization of, of a bigger size is bigger um, than companies that are small to medium size and, and are able to experiment, right? Well, and that's that's totally it. Like the big companies, I think it's easy to have a big win or a big loss by entering the metaverse. But one thing we haven't really touched on is all the companies that will help other companies build in service the metaverse. Like there's a, there's an ecosystem around being in the metaverse. So it's not just the one dimension of like who's in and who's not. And it's also like you're saying use case. What are you doing in? And right now, a lot of what we're what we hear in the media are those big brands and it's the PR, it's the marketing, but there's a lot of other space to fill uh, that small companies can come and be the leader. Like that's one thing I get so jazzed about in this whole digital assets ecosystem is that there's no 20 year ex expert. There's no somebody that's telling you this is the way you have to do it. It's us that gets to figure out what this future looks like and what we, how we want to use the technology. Well, good yeah. lawyer's going to race BLG to the metaverse now. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I would even argue that I think for smaller businesses, there is a better chance at the metaverse because, you know, when you think about what we talk about Pepsi, we talk about these bigger brands. For them, it, it is really for the PR. I don't think it's a revenue drive for them. But then when you look at the smaller businesses, a lot of them are making pretty pretty big revenue on the metaverse. And a lot of the, you know, the more prominent projects in the space started very, very small. You know, the Board Ape Yacht Club, you have CryptoPunk, uh, Vancouver-based Dapper Labs. These are all great examples of smaller firms winning in the space. And I think uh, for a lot of them, you know, to compete in a different space that is more established is very difficult. Say, if I want to create another bank in Canada right now, it's not possible. Like, and <clears throat> that, that is really, I think, you know, you have the platform and you have the ecosystem and smaller firm have the same opportunity to leverage that same as the bigger brands. And for them, um, you know, that is really a, a leap and for them to grow quickly. Um, and I think for the bigger brands, uh, that is it's actually helping the smaller brands, I think, 
you know, you have Gucci, LVMH, they're bringing people to the metaverse. And then these people are also exposed to the smaller uh, firms that also offer, you know, cooler stuff, better stuff, you know, something that is different and with more risk, but they're willing to take that. And I think that's really important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's like an opportunity because it's not saturated at all, right? Yeah, and I think experimentation, uh, a lot of companies that are experimenting at this point um, are experiment, experimenting in more private environments than, than permissionless environments. So I think that's one of the big difference so that they're able to experiment and fail in, in a more closed setting and learn from their failures and then enter you know, a more public environment, especially for, for big major brands that want to do it right. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the big things that we're seeing in the space as well. Right on. Uh, to add on, I mean, no longer can a CEO of a company go ask his chief metaverse, I mean, chief marketing officer and be like, hey, what's our meta metaverse strategy? And he'd be like, what is the metaverse? He's going to get fired. Like, this is how quickly it has developed. All major companies, uh, like they're developing digital asset teams, they're developing metaverse teams to look into Web3 currently. Yeah, I was talking with a guy from H&M the other day, and he was saying the exact same thing. Um, okay, last question, folks. We, it's flown by. Um, I'll get you each to give me uh, one quick answer to this one. The metaverse is changing rapidly. I think we've established that. Um, last year, the real estate gold rush took the headlines, and this year seems to be more focused on UX and gaming. So just with that little sort of anecdote to start us off here, um, what are your thoughts on the next big trend in virtual worlds? Kick it off, Julie. Uh, I've, I've kind of alluded to it earlier, but I think it's entertainment. I think that that is a way that you're going to really drive user adoption, which then is going to bring more people playing with how else they can use the metaverse. Uh, entertainment and gaming. I don't know if you guys have seen on Netflix, the uh, Gray Man. Uh, Gray Man did the first premiere in the metaverse for a movie. So this opens up entire entertainment industry who looks at uh, the metaverse as a go-to-market strategy in terms of marketing. And of course, gaming, I really believe these are two, but the, I, I really would like education and healthcare to take the advance because that's where we can really impact humanity. Yeah, I think also uh, there's a new term called NFT by now that is pretty interesting. That's going to be interesting to see how I uh, pan out. Basically, you're able to, you know, it's like DeFi, but for NFT, you're able to land, borrow NFTs. Then also this also ties up, so I guess, to regulations, how you're going to protect the IP laws and stuff like that. So this is really uh, something that I'm heavily focusing on uh, to, to see, to research, but also I would say digital identity. That's something that's really big. Um, you know, not that everybody wants to disclose their identity to anyone on the metaverse, but how do you unify that to have a universal agreement of identity? I think that's something interesting to see. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would say um, retail is going to be the next big thing in, in the metaverse, and they're going to drive a lot of traffic in these metaverse platforms. Uh, digital identity, I, I totally agree. I think that's going to be that's going to have to be solved for for broader adoption and for institutions to be able to identify and interact with their customers at, at scale. Um, and the last thing I would say is just, I'm, I, I would be curious to see if there is a Web2 centralized platform that can integrate some of the Web3 capabilities around NFT sales and stuff. So, and then interoperability among these platforms is gonna have to be solved for as well. And just like tying into that, like what I would love to see, it might not be the next thing, but I would love to see the integration between metaverse and physical world. So I'd love to see going into a movie, finding something like a, a, a sweater that you like, clicking on it, purchasing it in the metaverse and having it shipped to your office or like other kind of like things that mix our two worlds together. And I think that's what's really going to help with education, cultural awareness, just being able to share more and integrate more. Yeah, the, the concept of digital, the physical and the digital is is definitely gaining a lot more momentum. And that's something that a lot of uh, a lot of institutions are looking at right now because they want to be like they want to interact with their customers in a digital way, but also serve them in the physical world in some way, shape or form. And someone that let's say someone that's buying, I don't know, a Gucci um, bag 
they would want to be able to carry their Gucci bag in the metaverse as well as in, in real life. So tagging that NFT to the met, to any particular metaverse and particular that particularly that bag is going to be critical for these um, for the digital to to come to come to real life. And it's uh, just uh, commu community based too. Like if you look at Shiba. Uh, we have the head of Shiva who gave us uh, the board ape, his board ape to showcase at our booth. So please come check it out. But, it, you know, like board ape is a community. And then they're talking about getting into the metaverse. Shiba Inu was a joke, you know, a meme coin. And now they're uh, looking at uh, the metaverse. So it, it it is also that people can really come together and create a community and then take the community into the metaverse. And it would be a global community. So there's so many different use cases, I'm not, it's, and it's a very exciting and fun space. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add a final note here, and that is uh, education. I think that education is one of the biggest problems we have in society today, and I think the metaverse provides an avenue to really democratize that. And when you're talking about Gray Man, I was picturing you know the biggest movie theater in the world. You know, if you could have the biggest university in the world educating future generations in this decentralized way, I think that would be um, a very positive use case. Tyler, you gave me the note, so. Yes, I did. Let's get some questions going. So I'll leave it to you. Questions from the audience. This is more of an opinion question. I hear the word metaverse thrown around a lot, but there is no one metaverse. Um, Stats this year had Decentraland having 24 people in 24 hours walking around looking for people. There's more people in this room that were logged into Decentraland. So in your opinion, after the billion spent, after companies like Second Life did it, why have we not seen the adoption? Why has it been a dismal failure to the tune of billions of dollars? Like what is the piece that's missing to make this work. <laughs> you can pass that one for a second. Huh? It's too early to say that anything is a failure. There is no one metaverse, like you said. So what has failed? And I think also, we're, like we're talking about all the, the potential adoption use cases at all the different industries. Like we're, it's far, far too early to say that this has worked or this hasn't worked. You need to put the investment in up front to build something. And I don't think that we've got it quite right yet. And I don't think we even know, like what the first question was like, what's the metaverse? And it's like, well, 10 months ago, I would have said it's one thing. And now I'm saying it's something different because it's still evolving. Web van, Instacart. I mean, I. Well, I so, uh, I mean, adoption in terms of C, uh, Decentraland has its own cryptocurrency called Mana. Mana uh, fluctuates about a quarter billion, sometimes about a billion dollars every 24 hours. So a cryptocurrency, maybe there might be 24 or 20,000 people in the metaverse in Decentraland, but the cryptocurrency is already, people are speculating on it. And there's 92,000 parcels of land which have been already sold a few times over. So there's investors already in it on the land base and there's investors already on it on the cryptocurrency. In terms of adoption, we don't really know, uh, but when uh, and the best way I think is I have three kids under the ages of 12 and I really go to them and I I put my 80 year old girl in front of a screen on Decentraland within a minute. She was able to uh, walk around uh, uh, Decentraland because they uh, and I learned a new thing, AWSD and most people my age or most CEOs won't know what AWSD is. AWSD is how you can move around in the metaverse, but it's used on your left hand. So your right hand can be using the mouse. So kids are using real estate, that little bit real estate and utilizing it more. So I think in terms of adoption, I think within the next five years, we are created. We have already created a generation which knows how to operate in these virtual worlds. So you will see, I believe, adoption over the next five years, like extremely. Yeah, I think um, one of the points that Julia had mentioned there, and you had mentioned as well, right? There is no one metaverse. So you could be missing out on the calculation of the number of people that are 
let's say Accenture, right? Like Accenture handed out Oculuses to all of its employees, right? They're, they're collaborating in the metaverse. KPMG, we are collaborating with, with our clients in the metaverse as well. They're bringing them in. So all of those numbers are not being looked into today. Um, adoption is increasing, right? And especially the way those numbers were calculated as well, there was speculation and DAP radar came back and you know corrected their figures. Those numbers were based on how many users were actually transacting in the metaverse on that day, uh, how many users actually triggered a particular smart contract. So those numbers and how you calculate it. So a lot of you know education needs to go behind that because I know I, and I know you know as part of our initial call, I mentioned the same thing to Karam, and I think it was that day when uh, someone tweeted that 38 or something users in in Decentraland. Um, but again. It depends on how you look at what metaverse you want to look at and um, how do you calculate those numbers, right? And it's we're way too early to see a critical adoption of, of a metaverse platform at this point. Can we, can we not draw an analogy to you know owning a .com or a .io or a .ai or you know what I mean? Like, how is it if the metaverse is this different layer, allowing for a new kind of collaboration communication online? Is owning a little piece of the central land like owning a dot com twenty years ago? It's it's like owning part of Calgary twenty years ago, more like owning part of Toronto twenty years ago, because it, it, it's not a dot com thing, but you got to think of it as like real estate development, right? Like in a city, you think, oh, it's got ninety two thousand parcels of land, and that's it. So whoever owns this twenty one million bitcoins going to happen, right? There's that's why the power or the value of Bitcoin is one of the reasons is because of the limit of 21 million. And why is, I believe, Decentraland are going to be very valuable or Sandbox or the de decentralized platform which have parcels of land is because there is a limit by code of 92,000 some parcels of land, which gives a very small group of people an opportunity uh, to become extremely wealthy. Uh, over the next because they will if they own the land no one else can own that particular piece of land so think of it more as analogy of you buying land in the 80s in Toronto downtown yeah just you know just in terms of decentralized land uh, specifically I think it's really the community that is different from what you would traditionally see uh, like a metaverse that's a Minecraft that is a I would say arguably very similar traits to Decentraland. You can build, you can interact, but Minecraft is the mo most popular game in the world. It's because they are actually gamers that play in Minecraft, but people who bought land on Decentraland or they bought mana, they are usually not gamers. I would say a small amount of they are, um, but that is also why you don't see a lot of people on Decentraland. Not to say that the whole metaverse is a, a question mark, it's just Decentraland itself. You, you don't see a lot of people using it because of that. Yeah, thanks. Another question? Can you hear me? A uh, very interesting topic, and thank you so much to the panel. Um, I'm the founder of Jobifer, and at Jobifer, we believe in the power of human connection and people helping people achieve their highest potential. Um, we're focused on the jobs industry. How do you see the metaverse strengthen human connection and helping people, helping each other achieve their highest potential? Julie? All right. I mean, I, I think the global aspect of it is key uh, and just being able to train and help people without uh, having any sort of physical barriers. I think that's going to be critical in just that knowledge sharing piece. Um, I think that there's more that can happen as well, but uh, I think it has to start there and and then build on top of it. I think some of the examples that Karam had mentioned earlier on, like um, you know the girl that he was talking about. Um, so I think a lot of those we're going to see, especially for uh, you know it, it, the accessibility and in the metaverse. And this may be a controversial topic, but like someone came to me and, and asked okay how, do we want to build stairs as well as you know a ramp uh, in the metaverse but someone in in the metaverse 
to not may, may not want to have that same kind of disability that they have in the real life so the opportunity for them to be able to experience get gain some experiences that they may not be fortunate enough to get in the real life they are able to get that in 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 the metaverse um i someone gave me a very very good analogy around metaverse experience for the first time was it was like going for scuba diving and for all of the divers there it takes time for you to get accustomed to the immersive experience that you're in because it's a completely new world that you've not been in before and so all of those things the ability to be, to be able to experience something that you've not experienced in real life uh is going to be able to help them you know achieve more and learn more in real life and it is uh, amazing because you know it comes from education and i hope uh, uh i can give an example of one of the best uh, education institutions in calgary called uh rundle academy and uh, they started a, a rundle studio program where they've created a school for uh, uh learning disability uh, kids who are basically working uh um wherever they are in a, in a sort of a metaverse and that metaverse that they're using has 55000 kids already so we 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 are already have the technologies and capability to have these type of global connected immersive experiences and a great example he gave me was you know when i was going to school if someone was to explain a dna uh they draw it or i'd see a video about it but here they're able to give a dna to someone uh or to a kid and the kid can like make it bigger go into the arteries go into this portion that portion and have a whole different understanding um because their perspective is completely different to what we as uh, as um, you know people got to experience it's like they get to make the magic school bus actually happen I don't know if anybody no I I'm not that. a lot of parents That's exactly room. what I was thinking. <laughs> Making learning fun again. Okay But, everybody that's it for us so uh let's give a big round of applause to our panel.